started with this. The whole notion of the secret weapon has to do with the fact that that we, you know, we're in the position where, just like you're experiencing this in New York, that that uh, we we need to dictate care to insurers. We forget that we're the doctors here, you know, and and the whole system is shifted. I don't care whether it's medical doctors or chiropractors. The whole system is shifted to insurers dictating care to you, which doesn't make any sense. You know, when you went to school to be a doctor, you're supposed to be the one that makes clinical decisions. And uh, insurance companies, I don't know any adjuster that knows anything about healthcare, medicine, et cetera. They don't have any scientific knowledge that they're the ones making these decisions. It's unbelievable to me. But I wanted to change that. This was, you know, long, many, many years ago, I noticed this, this shift occurring back in the early 90s, actually. Um, and then the other thing was that I, I hear about people complaining constantly about attorneys never referring patients to them. They want you to refer to the attorney, but they don't want to refer patients back. Well, this is a shift, the secret weapon is a shift that actually brings the, uh, the attorney to you instead. And it's because you have specialized knowledge that, uh, that they don't have or no other doctor does. There's no other, other health care provider that will actually perform these, these types of tests because they don't have the, the PTs don't have an interest in anything but treatment and MDs don't want to touch patients. And soft tissue is the area that, that you know, chiropractors are best at. So suddenly, out of the blue, attorneys are recognizing and valuing chiropractic in a huge way. Um, reducing the stress of your patient's lives is a big part of this stuff because when you use objective information, you're actually helping the patient to uh, reduce their stress because they can show their friends and family that they really are, they feel like they're imposters, they feel like they're faking after they've, they're, they're in a lot of pain, um, there's no broken bones, and they feel like they're, they're faking, they, they feel like that they have to prove that they're not, they're actually really injured, uh, but using objective data helps, and the SQL weapon has that power to do that. This whole notion of attorneys, this is a huge one, attorneys uh, have this tendency to call up and everyone, ask everyone to cut their bills, this is a phenomenon that occurs all over the United States, um, and uh, this is, this doesn't happen to anyone that uses a secret weapon, and it's because of the fact that everybody gets paid well. Uh, receiving the respect you deserve as a doctor is a big part of this whole thing. It, you know, you deserve to be treated well, you deserve to be respected, and, and the only way you can do that these days is to prove what you're doing. And I wouldn't necessarily consider a sheep with a multi-cannon gun here as a way to do it, but it's a kind of a funny picture. Um, so... So 2015, it's all about, what I'm talking about here, it's all about cash or crash. And what I mean by that is that there's a niche that you, you belong in. There's 77,000 uh, uh, soft tissue cases filed each year, auto accident cases. And I want to make it so that chiropractors are the first ones they call. And this is what this is all about. The cash side is also important, too. You know, we all know that general insurance has gotten kind of nasty for everyone. I don't care where you are in healthcare; It's gotten nasty. So I'm seeing this trend where it's, it's cash or, and I say crash, I mean PI. And so um, now one of the things that, that, that was necessary to create the secret weapon was to make sure that we wipe out the fallacies that have been created by insurers. And they've created huge fallacies and gotten everybody to believe. The first thing you think of when you think of service EMG is, that's dumb. Why would anyone do it? Everybody knows that it's, well, that image is, is not only completely false, it's, it's 1990. And the schools do it. Uh, I just did a presentation at one of the schools, a clinic director. I walked in, and this guy is extremely well trained. And he's done needle EMGs himself, knows everything about this. And he said, okay, you know, the president of the college said, uh, I need to talk to you and, and possibly start working with you. Um, but don't, have, don't tell me anymore about the technology. I know all about it. And I said, well, tell me how it works then. If you really think you know about it, tell me how it works. He goes, oh, it's really easy. You just touch down the electrodes to the skin and you take a quick reading and then it shows this little picture of a man with the bar sticking out. I said, not even close, not even remotely close. And uh, he goes, yeah, there's no research on it, et cetera. And I keep hearing this. And so this is a continuous thing where they presented as junk science. Uh, in the courtroom, which is where I've never lost a case, and, and Greg himself has done extremely well, is, and you don't always have to go to court. I mean, depositions are where you, where you end up. And, and the more we win of these, the less that, that ever happens because they're settling cases left and right now. Um, and what you do is uh, the last case I was in, they were claiming there's no studies on service EMG. They're all on needle. When you go to PubMed, which is available and it's free through the government, you do a search on service EMG of 8,267 studies. Try to imagine what happens to an expert witness at $1,200 an hour that says there's no studies in service EMG in deposition, and I present this on the other side as a rebuttal. You can imagine what happens to his credibility. 
So the reality and what's presented are completely false. The second thing we need was needed was to demolish the insurers because their position on this, their position on chiropractic, their position on on the tech tool that chiropractors use to prove what they do, the the dyna myovision dynamic EMG, the Dynaram EMG. Um, motion EMG is something that was being ripped to shreds on a continuous basis because of the fact that they would have to pay for it. So there's a case in Florida. This was the state of uh, Richard Merritt versus the Department of Health. So it was, it was literally myself as the only expert witness representing the chiropractic profession. Believe it or not, he contacted all the science people in the chiropractic profession. Not one responded to this. Um, now, one in, the, in this arena uh, responded. I was the only one to show up, and I was up against 75 attorneys, nine expert witnesses, an MD, PhD, uh, whose expertise was service EMG, and uh, I, I was successful at beating them on the lower court, le court level, the Superior Court level, and the Supreme Court of Florida established uh, that or rejected the appeal. Now, the result of this was a statute in the state of Florida, and this requires, and you can see what it says here, that service EMGs achieved a level of medical acceptance as a valuable diagnostic tool for injuries of the spine and upper lower back. This case was so huge because what it does is it established for the rest of the country in this 47-page decision, and normally they're, they're five or six pages, um, that the tool could be used to evaluate for soft tissue injury and it established it everywhere in the country because it went to the highest level courts in the state of Florida. And the decision being 47 pages long is something no judge is going to want to go through themselves. So they accept this for admissibility in every state in the country. I've never seen it not accepted. Now the next thing was to get a CPT code for billing it. So um, the interesting part about this is this code 96002 and 96004 are specifically for dynamic EMG. Establishing the courtroom is a valid uh, a proof that the, that the tool is valid. Uh, but the key part here is that the test takes the same time as doing range of motion with a little bit more. It pays about five times more for personal injury. And uh, it actually pays five times more for the code itself. And so that was a huge thing to have accomplished. The next step was to win the support of all healthcare providers. Uh, and it's funny because when this ended up in the AMA's book on range of motion, I was really attacked in a big way in the in our profession for for having the AMA recognize chiropractic uh, chiropractic tool as valid. And that was really it was very surprising to me. It's like we've been wanting the the world to acknowledge what we do, and I finally achieved this through this uh, guilt through association, and it. Uh, now everybody recognizes how important this is because they show this to an attorney with the myovision being shown in this book and its instant credibility and it's used in every, this book is shown in every freaking deposition that I've done in the last, I don't know how long now, it's being used and that's it. The attorney drops it and says, okay, it, it's admissible. There isn't any argument after that point. But the main thing is John Gerhard who, who, who invented range of motion truly uh, wrote this book, wrote the stuff in the AMA guides. Uh, after using the myovision for 12 years, recognized that that surface EMG without range of, without range of motion surface EMG was relatively without value, and the reason is that you couldn't. He says you can't assess effort. Further than that, you can't see guarding without it, and that's a huge part of of why this works so well. The next step was, and this was one of my favorites. We actually had, uh, I call it the hybrid DC, a, a very subluxation-based doctor. Th th this is a rare thing to have someone go into the courtroom and talk about subluxation and win, just because the jury doesn't care. They don't know what, it, what anyone's talking about. We, we thought in the past we could use language that no one understood and we win. It doesn't work that way. They want things explained to them in simple terms. Well, this chiropractor, uh, Alan Fraley in the state of Washington, went to jury trial five-plus hours on the myovision stuff, and I believe it was, it was it was almost all on the myovision stuff. Um, and what happened there was exactly uh, what happens in all these cases. And this is proof of what I was talking about. They think everybody's doing static EMGs from the 90s. They don't realize there's a motion EMG test. The attorney says to the IME, but wait a minute, you're talking about static. That's all they want to talk about because they can knock static EMG, even though I'm not going to say that that's, that's not accurate. Static EMG is valuable, but, but it's like a knife versus a gun. The static EMG is like the knife, the dynamics like the gun. And uh, this, this subluxation-based carpenter went into the courtroom and established the absolute 
reason for his justification for him seeing this patient over a six-month period when the IME said that he shouldn't have seen him more than six times by using the average to prove it. So we went, now we have subluxation-based chiropractors going to the corner and winning because they have a tool to use to win these. Uh, the next thing was getting attorneys to demand it. And this was a big deal because most of them were so skeptical because they bought into the insurance company position that all EMG is static EMG. Um, so, and like Brandon Casey says, he's, just, he's the one that won that case. Uh, he thought this stuff was silly 10 years ago. And now uh, he sees every one of his cases settling for approximately 10 times what is offered and by using the myovision, every single one. And this is where you see that attorneys do not call you to cut your bill anymore. Uh, the next step was to get the Bar Association involved. And believe it or not, four weeks ago, this is Alan and myself, uh, the Bar Association, while I was at this meeting, I went there just to drop him off, actually. He was doing a presentation on soft tissue injury to the group that does, uh, does uh, personal injury work for the state of Washington. There's probably about... There's 150 there, and there was a webcast, probably 250 or 300 people were watching this. And in the middle of it, Brandon Casey, who's up at the front, um, said that something about the um, David Mark Carey and the guy that invented it, the genius that invented it, someone said this, is going to be here to speak to us. And out of the blue, I was up speaking to these people. and went from four weeks ago from this being so the first time some of these people had seen the motion side of this to uh, now all of them demanding it out of the blue, four weeks. That's how quick attorneys are when they see something that works. They, what's interesting about this in this uh, particular presentation, though, was there, there were three attorneys that had a lot of experience with it that were just you know, amazed by it. The fourth one was really interesting in that I had done tests for this guy, one test for him on a patient, and the patient was screaming and moaning and just, oh, it was in so much pain. And I told the attorney back then, this is four years ago, that I, you know, if you're going to ask me to testify in this case that I'm going to be not going to help you at all because the data shows that this guy, I don't care how much he's groaning, he's completely not, he's a symptom magnifier, the worst I've ever seen, the best at doing it I've ever seen. And he he said at this thing that he wished he listed me because he, he would have saved almost $200,000 in his own money, filed a $5 million case, and lost because it was true, this guy was, no one could corroborate this, his, his claims. And I nailed it the first time. One of the things attorneys love about this is knowing if they have a good case up front or not, which is why it's worth doing. That is enough for attorney referrals alone. But when it comes right down to it, what this is about really is that there's two kinds of service EMG. There's the static EMG, which shows the bar show levels of muscle tension with the uh, length of the bar proportional levels of tension. This is a very, very valuable tool. It works extremely well. It's great for patient education, tracking progress. It's a great outcomes measure, actually. Um, but And Greg used to make fun of it, but it's, it actually works extremely well. Uh, but it's not the same thing. It's, this is the knife. Motion EMG, where we measure muscle activity, we graph range of motion at the bottom of the screen, and we measure muscle activity on the top. We look at the guarding response at the top. When someone's in full flexion, which is at this position here, the muscles should be shut off completely, which means there's no guarding response. If they fire like crazy, there's a problem. It's acute. So these are two different tests. They want you to believe that static is the only machine there is, the only type of tool there is. So the negative response to service EMG has to do with the fact that there's two tools with similar name, and the key is to capitalize on the confusion, which is what attorneys are doing right now. It's not this test that was done, and every deposition they go, they, talk, they want to talk about static EMG when, in fact, you did dynamic EMG, motion with range of motion. And this combination of these two is what's so deadly, because you can see how far they bent and if there was a guarding response, yes, no. And so this is a very, very, this is the most important thing to remember how valuable this is. Now, this has been the biggest paradigm shift, the biggest shocker I've seen ever, which is that we've been using range of motion uh, in New York, you do range of motion uh, for uh, evaluating for soft tissue injury, for injuries. Well, what we're seeing in our data from clinically is about 50 to 70% of the patients that have completely normal range of motion have abnormal muscle guarding. And let me show you this example. This is a real patient. The person here uh, has completely normal range of motion will measure. The IME did the test and saw this and said, hey, guess what? They're normal. Send them home. Well, when you combine the muscle guarding with this and this patented tool, we're looking at the patient bending into flexion. This is what they look like. Their range of motion, yes, was completely normal. The results are the same on both these. But there's guarding. Guarding 
is what is it? Five day percent on the in the AMA guides is in terms of impairment. It's proof that there's injury, and that this this case went from being worth zero dollars to worth um, I'm not sure it was like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars or something. And uh, but the point is that that's all you needed. It's all we needed was this part of this tool. But if we use range of motion, we're basically working for the insurance company, and we're losing to them. And they don't. We don't even realize we're doing it. We just have all bought into this paradigm. This has changed things. And here's a normal over here. Someone bends into flexion, muscles shut off in flexion. It's that simple. This is them going through the motion. And when they drop, why is it that way? Because they are hanging off their ligaments. That's why. Um, make it easy to perform. So it's as easy as doing range of motion and easy to understand graphics. This is new. These graphics are actually tell the story very well. You've got a normal and the patient bends into flexion, muscle shut off. You have acute, this is what you see, and a chronic, it's right in the middle. And there's studies that support the use of it this, or, or this interpretation. There's, there's studies that show exactly this occurring. And it's this simple. That's all you have to know. There's three cases, and just look for those, and that's it. Are they, are they muscle shut off? Are they firing like crazy? Or are they, uh, are they in the middle somewhere? And the report's very simple to, to do. It just literally exports. Um, or you can use uh, uh, what what Gray's done is really great with his software. You can use his software to do it also, and it, uh, the new MyVision software and sends out an interpretation report. And you can actually use drop downs to select what you see in it. It's really simple. Or Greg's software also does that very well too. Uh, and what's the but the part that's huge here, bigger than bigger than all the rest of it, is how this affects patients. Like I was saying, that they get very stressed because they believe that. They everybody everybody looks at them like they're they're faking they're not real and when they have this to take home and they get to show their their friends and family that guess what hey I really am in pain and I had a case about three weeks ago a woman who a workers comp case um, she looks perfect in every way possible she's a beautiful woman she's in incredible shape and you'd never believe in a million years that this person smiling happy is in so much pain uh, the reason is she has a very high tolerance for pain um, and everyone in her all of her doctors have all looked at her like you know what are we gonna do this person obviously is not experiencing pain well guess what the test results looked like the chronic looked like she's been having trouble for a long time that's all that's needed to establish and reopen a case for her the cash side, though, I want to make sure that you understand. The cash side, I think, is really great, and data is crucial there also. Data wins there also, and what I did for that was, and I love the fun stuff, I created eScan where you do this static EMG test. You do it, and right from the, the second you do the test, you email it right to the patient's smartphone. And, and the patent on this is actually to use email to send it. It's not an app. There's too many apps out there, uh, and it sends it. Uh, via email and what ends up happening. I didn't realize the byproduct of that is they receive it now, three reinforcements. And at the bottom of the screen, you can see it has your custom message in it. It's an ad for your practice. And in beta testing, it was really interesting to see what people did. Uh, the number of patients that are there to see you, that want to see you for just general health, um, that are battling at home justifying why they're still seeing this their chiropractor is amazing because in beta testing at least 30 percent of the people said wow uh, you know I, my injury was over a long time ago but I still love seeing my chiropractor and now I can show my husband why I'm still doing it and they would forward this on it was amazing to see that happen the first thing they said was cool when they when they see you and they go to lunch afterwards with their friend or they go to dinner this is the first thing they're going to show the other thing really amazing is they're, po they're posting this on Facebook uh, and that's an ad for your practice. Uh, you can change the message very easily. Now, the EP stress score is something that I use to set, simplify the static EMG. And what it does, and, and Greg, you'll see this over time with your patients too, that you'll see that the readings drop over a period of time. Now, this is looking at a pre and post adjustment, which I don't recommend doing. It's just someone said, oh, I think this is worthless, and uh, doing a pre and post adjustment would prove it. And so we did one, and here's what it looked like. Uh, you can see the EP stress score is a sum of all the readings in one single number. It makes it very easy to track their progress. And you'll see two conditions that occur. One is that when they come in, the readings are high, which means they're acute, and they'll drop over time. Or the second case, they come in, they're low, and the readings will increase at first and then drop. And we've gotten enough people to, to confirm this by looking at their tests that this is what happens. And they're low because of the fact that they're in a fatigue state when they come in because their muscles have been firing for a long period of time, their contracture. You start adjusting and you get things firing more normally, you see an increase, and then you'll see the readings drop down again. 
So that's what happens with this. It's very simple. The study's solid on this. The studies were done by the VA hospital. And what's interesting was they looked at how the correlation between the VAS score and static service EMG, and it was like 0.9 something. The point is that they have an objective way of doing a VAS score, a subjective objective response. The non, this is looking at a three-month study. There was 30 non-responders to care, 30 that did respond to care. Their VAS score was 6.6 .6 when they started, 6.8 when they finished. There was no statistically significant difference in the sum, the EP stress score, microvolts, 884 to start, 709 when they ended. When you look at the responders, they started at 6. They responded to care drop to 1. Look at the change in the EP stress score from 542 to 180. And this is what was needed to come up with this. It's a phenomenal study, well published. And so the power, like I was saying about the eScan, it's your eBiz card. It's like people call it the follow-up call. Uh, it's like you, you send it to them right away, they get it, um, and it helps to justify because you're focused on function instead of symptoms. That's one of the coolest things about this. And, and they walk away, reinforce, reinforce the message because the truth is the studies show that patients remember about 10% of what you say, 15% maybe, and this way it's a way to reinforce what you said immediately without having to make a call to them to remind them. So it saves time. It saves a lot of paper, too, because you don't have to print these things out. What I think is really funny as a race car driver is that I went, and this blew my mind when I saw this, we don't use any technology at all in our profession, and we wonder why we're not going beyond that, that you know, now it's down to 6% of the population. And I got to tell you, look at what BJ was doing many, many years ago. He took this profession from non-existent to the the uh, it was the number one alternative healthcare uh, we were the number one health, uh, alternative healthcare providers in, in 1935 in about seven years by using technology he tested every single person he knew the value of this when and, and I, I find it really interesting that I, that we have this discussion in the chiropractic profession when you look at the root of it the history B J Palmer tested everybody the N C M is what he did and he showed he knew the value of showing and he was really good at doing that. And he grew the profession like crazy because of that. But that was the, the one thing he did differently that made it grow in a seven-year period to what it was um, by using technology back then, 1935 or whatever it is. So anyways, this is what this – I went to take my car in for an alignment. This guy's backed up three months to get alignments. He uses this tool that shows the pre-adjustment, post-adjustment, sort of like what we do with the myovision, pre- and post-adjustment. And – what do you think you're going to do when you see this? Yeah, go ahead and align it. And then the favorite part, though, is that it actually has in, the, in the, the computer, it says making the adjustments. It actually has this built in, it's using the same terminology as we. And so we, you know, we have to start integrating technology. It's 2014. It's time for us to recognize that this is how only way we're going to push ourselves in through the current. We're in a very, very data-driven society. We have to move in that direction or we're going to be left behind. And so everybody else is using technology. Patients demand it. They requ they require it. They they need to know why. And if you don't give them why in an objective way, they are not going to listen. They want to see it. They don't want to hear it. There's too much information going around. So um, the key here is that every warrior, and I need warriors out there, needs a weapon. And the, this Dynaron Motion EMG is the secret weapon you use to guarantee that you're treated fairly and your patients treated fairly by insurance companies. And again, this is focused in the PI arena, but don't forget this applies to uh, everything else too. If you want to see the actual court documents, I'm in a $1 million case right now and I've got the uh, soft tissue case. You can email success at myovision.com and we'll have sent back to you the, uh, the, current, uh, the, the, the current court documents that tie directly to this to see how, how the insurers fared how the uh, defense attorneys fared in this case when the myovision was utilized and how it how it changed the entire course of this case. And, and the reason it did uh, was their position was there's no validity to it. You can imagine when, when their expert witness in deposition says there's no studies on service CMG, they're only on needle, and I show there's 8,237. The next thing that happens to this person in the world of law is that their expertise is questioned about every statement that they make. So every single thing that you take one brick out, the whole house falls. Every statement that he made about every other aspect, which he may have been right or wrong, it doesn't matter. The attorney's going to say to him, but when now when you're talking about these x-rays or you're talking about our MRI, that's your interpretation. But when you did the interpretation of the myovision stuff, you said there was no validity to it, yet you were completely wrong. Why would you be correct here? 
That's what's going on with this, and this is what ends up happening with insurers. And the reality is they're hoping you don't know about this. They're hoping, and most of the attorneys on both sides have bought into the belief that there is no validity to this. And, there, and, and the, the difference between what they, what they believe in reality is so dramatically different that it means an instant win for us, for the chiropractic profession. And that's one of the main reasons I want you to utilize these, this technology. So are there any questions at all? Any questions, David? How long does it take to do a test? Uh, the question is, how long does it take to do a test? Do you mean static or dynamic? Dynamic, I'll, end, I'll answer that. It takes me an average of seven minutes. And that's usually when I'm doing both cervical and lumbar. Yeah. So it's, it's, the, the, the amount of time to do a test is however long it takes you to measure the range of motion, which is very quick. It takes a, a, a minute or two just to set it up, the electrodes and all that. The test itself is the easiest part of it. And it used to take longer. When they went wireless, it seemed to cut the time down. Right? Way down. Yeah, it's way down. It, it is. It's that quick. I've been on video doing it in three and a half minutes per test, so it matches exactly what you just said. Yeah. So, yep. Yeah, so it's very fast. When I first started doing the interpretations, it took me about a half an hour. And then I, I got clever. I started, uh, I wrote down for myself all the normals for each motion. And then I wrote down all the different abnormal variables. And I started copying and pasting. So I brought it down from 30 minutes down to about 15 to 20 minutes. And then when I went into my EMR to do it, I was able to get it down to one minute. Yep. So I can do it in about one minute. And That's same with good. this, too. The MyVision software, um, it's the same thing. When you to do it, when you do an interpretation, um, now you what we did was we, this is new, this is just released. Uh, you're able to open up a test and... Um, you right click on the screen, this is what it shows on here, which gives you your, your actual things for attorneys. They love seeing these graphics this way. Um, and you select a template, which you can modify if you want to. And then what it does is it exports the, um, it ex exports the exam into a Word doc. And the Word doc itself is something that, um, let's see, is it right here? Here it is. And it fills everything in with all the information, the patient, et cetera. And, all, and it shows the test. It gives you all the information on how the test was done with photographs. Uh, it shows what you'd expect for a normal built into this report. And the cool thing about this, this is a templated Word document. So you can actually uh, change it and save this template with your own verbiage. You can say, make it say whatever you want to. The data still shows up in it. And we actually put in the AMA guides now. We can, we can actually put in uh, all kinds of data in this now. Uh, but all you do is you select what you saw. So this case was normal. So we have a normal patient experience, normal, et cetera. You just go through this. You're looking at about five minutes per uh, or less per interpretation. You just zip through this, and then you can put whatever information you want that's different. You can add other, other information to this conclusion yourself. You can even save your signature in here. Then you just go file, and you save as PDF, and you've got a PDF you can send to an attorney, and that's it. So, and that's it's that simple. So we made it very, very easy to do, and takes a minute. And the static EMG takes about thirty seconds, maybe, or, or I'm sorry, thirty to thirty seconds to a minute to perform the static EMG. Uh, the, I, do, I do static EMG on uh, on the first visit on every new patient. I, I do it after I finish. Once I do the ortho neuro exam and I tell them it was all normal, now I want to show them this, and then the, my have a, my monitor for the computer in my office for this test. Is a 42-inch LED TV, so it's just big and bright and bold. So I do the static EMG and I show them, and that's probably my patient's favorite thing because they, they see it and understand it instantly. That's so great. Like, oh, yeah, it's really, it's really wild. And and Dave was right. I used to make fun of the, the I made fun of servicing the static servicing EMG for probably two or three years before I ever actually did it. And the first time I did it was on a 10-year-old child who had asthma. And his grandparents brought him into my office. He was visiting for spring break and wanted me to check. They said, hey, would you check him? I'm sure I'd be happy to check him. And I thought, well, what am I going to check him with? <laughs> I can palpate. Yeah. Well, you know, what, I, what am I going to do, give him an outcome questionnaire? Or a measurement measure by, on my eye? Like, what am I going to do? So I thought, you know, I, I'm going to try this. This is the first time. I, I, I made fun of it. I'm not going to tell anybody that I did it for a couple of years. I'm going to try it. So I did this serve the static EMG on where would you expect to find abnormal activity going on? Right like this guy, right there. Just like yeah. that. 
Well, it was right, right in the upper thoracic spine over there. It's exactly yeah. where it was in this kid. So I adjusted him, and I did some low-level laser on him also, and then I sent him on his way. And his grandparents came back the next week and told me that by the time I saw him, he was using his inhaler four times a day. And after I adjusted him, the rest of the week, he had not used his inhaler at all with that. And I just thought that was really cool that I was able to identify something and that I would have loved to have seen him again so I could scan him again and see if there was a difference with him. But I thought that was really awesome. So yeah, I, stopped, I stopped making fun of surface EMG at that point. <laughs> Static EMG, yeah, it's all just an image. And the reality is, I got, I got to make this really clear: the machines that exist in the past and competitors' machines, that that was the problem. Is that truly the reproducibility? And you hear this from everybody. Anyone that's had like competitor systems have been the big thing about the myovision. And even attorneys are telling me this: is that it's like, wow, this stuff is reproducible now. And, and it, the truth is, the myovision always was, um, but we had a lot of machines out there that just didn't work. And unfortunately. This profession was, they were being pushed to the profession as a way to fool people into becoming patients. That's what gave it a bad reputation. So now it's coming back because of the fact that it really works. And Greg's a great example of one of the biggest skeptics. We, we, I remember, Greg, when I first met you, I didn't even discuss it because I knew what would happen. It's like one of those things people think it's, the truth is it's making a big comeback, and I can almost guarantee it will be a CPT code for it in the next couple years or year even because of the fact there's so much good data supporting it at this point. And, and what I say about static EMG where I, I win this with every single case, I've even established the static EMG in the courtroom in a Superior Court case in, in California, is do you find, this is my, discu my discussion with a neurologist about it, do you think it's acceptable for a, a, a chiropractor or medical doctor, anyone to palpate? And the answer is always absolutely yes. I said, how would you feel if there was an electronic form of palpation that could be used and it could measure objectively what you're describing and what you're feeling with your hands? That would be fantastic. And I said, well, guess what? That's what static EMG is. And that's the end of the discussion. Any other questions for David? Uh, no questions, David. Anything else you want to share? Uh, no, that's it. This just one more thing about this, which is interesting. The two things we found are true are the low readings and the high readings are the important ones. This guy had a herniated disc. Somebody picked it out right away. And you can see the super low readings means that they're, the muscles are shut down from fatigue. The high readings are the acute. And that's all you have to know about this. And then the EP stress score is something. We don't use it as a number on its own. It doesn't mean anything. We use it as a baseline to start, and you see the patient over time to see the progression. That's all I wanted to point out here. Other than that, um, use technology, and not only will you be respected for what you do, but your, your patients will love you. And, uh, and the other thing I want to make sure is don't try to explain this to them if you do static EMG tests. Let the patient talk. Greg, I'm sure you've seen this, that it triggers them to tell you what's going on with their body. It's a reminder. They forget what's going on inside them. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I do. It's no, pretty cool. I, 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 I've had people ask me about the EP score, and they say, and they say, so do we do we want that number to go down to zero? I'm like, um, no. <laughs> That's death. That would, be, that would mean you're dead. That would not be a good one. Be the one so, That's funny. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, yeah, everybody. Right, thank you. Go back to bed. All right, good night. <laughs> yep.